All right, when is it right to bring your dog to dinner? Well, we'll talk about the law coming up tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, my instinct is to just say, are you kidding me? Legislate rah, 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 on this. But the truth of the matter is, I've learned over time that when you bring up animals, the radio phone lines go crazy. We could be talking about national security and the end of the world, and the phone lines are tepid. You talk about animals, and all heck breaks loose. So I am smart enough over my years to realize that this is stuff that really means a lot to people. So we will get into that. Charlene Lima, longtime ally, foe, friend, mostly, uh, on my show tonight. She's the rep from Cranston. Uh, she is her own person, I can tell you that much, and she's got her legislation that she's doggone <laughs> proud of. All right, we'll meet her coming up uh, momentarily. By the way, uh, Capitol Police, as we record the program, don't tell anybody, we produce this program late afternoon. We're in the midst of that uh, issue at the, uh, at the Capitol, obviously a lockdown. Uh, one injured uh, Capitol policeman, not seriously reported, and um, it seems like they got the situation under control, but You'll have learned more uh, over the course of the evening, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow, both on the radio and WPRO at noontime and back here on the television show. Let's go to the rundown and take a look at some of the things that are happening. By the way, belated happy Easter to everybody. Bob Healy, as you know, passed away, the lieutenant governor candidate, the gubernatorial candidate, the cool moose, uh, and certainly a one-of-a-kind type of guy. Uh, he's being waked uh, today, tonight, and I, I just... I wanted to offer this thought. Uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, the U.S. Senator from Rhode Island, seen here, uh, sent out a, a tweet message regarding Bob Healy. And I thought at first glance it was, it was very respectful and very much on the money. But then I thought about it, and today I retweeted it with this question. Look on the bottom if you're not a Twitter fan. This is how you read these things from the bottom up. Uh, Sheldon wrote, Bob Healy was a passionate, distinctive voice and an advocate for open, common-sense government. Thoughts over his family and friends. As I read that, I thought, you know what? In a lot of ways, that is very much true. And then I raised this question. I wonder what would have happened if the senator said that during the 2014 campaign. You know, death uh, provides all sorts of opportunity to, to make good on relationships. I don't think that uh, Sheldon and Bob had any issue between them. But Bob would get a kick out of me raising the question, well, Sheldon, if you'd said that during the campaign, maybe the 21% he got out of nowhere in about five weeks period of time would have been enough to earn him the actual governorship. Think about it. Next item. The, uh, the sentiment that seems to be bubbling, at least in parts of the Muslim community, seems to be a positive one. Uh, let's first take a look at what's going on over the weekend with the latest in ISIS and terror and all that. Belgian police are asking the public for more information about this man, seen walking with two suicide bombers just before the blasts at Brussels airport last Tuesday. He had been identified as Faisal C., who was arrested on a terror charge, but after an investigation, prosecutors released him today without charges. Weekend raids netted several more arrests. Four men were picked up in the Netherlands in connection to new bombing plots in France. Italian police detained a man of Algerian origin for allegedly being part of a forging ring that provided false documents to the terrorist cell being linked to the attacks in France and Belgium. It is still a time of mourning here in Brussels as hundreds attend an afternoon service here at the city's largest cathedral. It shows, you know, stand together. Eva Mason is visiting from England. She and her husband stopped to light a candle and to pray just before today's vigil. It is sad, very sad, but we're still here. We've still come and we've still come to look at this beautiful city. A group of Muslims is also mourning. They gathered in front of the metro station damaged in the attack. The group carried balloons and Belgian flags to show solidarity with the victims. And it is that sentiment that, that I'm talking about, the last, which is that Muslims themselves throughout the world are beginning to speak up a little bit. Now, recently we had two terrific experts here on the program who talked to us about the challenge that Islam has internally right now. The idea is what 
the Islamic State is trying to do is create a clash of civilizations between w the West and Islam. But in fact, what's happening is there is a clash within civilizations between the radical jihadists and mainstream Islam. And that is spilling over into the West. Our allies in that struggle are precisely those mainstream Muslim institutions yes. that are under attack by the jihadists. It's Mark Genest and Timothy Edgar from the Naval War College and Brown University, respectively. Uh, you get a headline like this in the Providence Journal, a commentary, an op-ed, and you start to see a little bit of percolating sentiment that, you know what, Muslims and Islam have got to reconcile. I talked to a, a, a person uh, who I, I have a lot of respect for, a friend, who is a practicing Muslim, and he said to me, you know what, I think the President of the United States ought to call a symposium of all Muslim country leaders. Bring them together, whoever, whoever doesn't show up is with ISIS. Bring them together and demand a plan that includes some reverse indoctrination on things like ISIS literally through the mosques and to penetrate the mosques throughout the world to start, you know, for lack of a better term, a PR campaign in the other direction. Now, it's a complicated conversation, but you're starting to feel a little bit of, I've had enough, even from the Muslim world which is a good thing amidst a very bad thing. Uh, more on that as we go, daily it seems. Uh, I just wanted to make a note on this. I saw this story in, in the papers this weekend and um, it caused me to think about the housing crisis itself. Many still underwater but fewer foreclosed. That means that some folks are upside down on their mortgage but they're staying in it. I just wanted to say this. If you're upside down on your mortgage, but you're continuing to, to, st to stay in it, meaning pay and stay in your home and look for other options, but you pay because it's the right thing to do, you're holding the housing economy together. This whole thing blew up in the mid-2000s, meaning 2006, 2007, because people bought money, bought homes with no money down, rather. Uh, and when their mortgages superseded the housing values, they just walked away from them. And when they walked away from them, the whole thing collapsed. So it's no embarrassment. In fact, I think it's a measure of your character and integrity to con continue to pay on a home that may be upside down. Eventually, you'll find a way to get out of it. But know that you're contributing to holding the economy together when you work through it. Uh, we got a whole bunch of political migration going on here. I thought this was kind of interesting. Take a look at some of these headlines here in Rhode Island. Here's the Donald. That's an appropriate picture for him. Um, we have some other, right, there's some other references to it. And then we've got some data, which is kind of interesting. So in Rhode Island, we've had, in this cycle, 4,817 people change party affiliation. And it breaks down this way. So 1,600 became Democrats from the unaffiliated world. 771 became Republicans from the unaffiliated and Democratic world. But 2,300 became unaffiliated from the Democratic and Republican world, as you see in each of those columns, read them up and down. The thing about this is, is that most people are figuring out that they can vote for Donald Trump if they want to or participate in the Republican primary here in Rhode Island from the unaffiliated position because we have open primaries. I just have to remind you that once you enter a primary, you have to uh, disaffiliate. You have to fill out the card and you have to say, I don't want to be in the party of this woman or that guy anymore and become unaffiliated again. Otherwise, you'll find yourself being labeled a Republican or a Democrat and you may not very well like that. You know, in a place that's reputed to be so, so blue, we are prorated the highest independent voting state in America. Have you thought about that? Then why are we so dominated by Democrats in the legislature. I'll have to ask my guest after we get past the dog situation. Uh, only one left, that, sorry, only one, one seed, one, one seed is left. North Carolina. That is amazing. This March Madness tournament has been incredible. Here's the bracket on, uh, on the final four. Number two, Villanova. Number two, Oklahoma. These are seeds, of course, within the regions. North Carolina and, uh, and number 10, Syracuse. Everybody argued that Syracuse didn't even belong in the hunt, but when Michigan State got beat in their bracket, they had a clean line first over my alma mater, Dayton. 
A very impressive uh, victory yesterday coming from 15 points behind against one seed Virginia with, what, five minutes to go. In fact, the whole tournament has been nothing but that kind of come from behind upset stuff. It's been fun to watch, no doubt about that. Uh, this weekend, the whole thing will be answered. By the way, tonight, UConn was playing, I don't know, somebody in the, uh, in the, in the regional final. Who cares? The semifinal, they won by 60 points. I'm talking about the women. 60 points. Doesn't seem fair. Dining with dogs. I don't know how to make this transition other than to show you this headline. And uh, our state representative, Charlene Lima. Boy, that's a nice family picture. How old is the dog? Five years old. What's the dog's name? Kiko. Kiko. K-I-K-O? K-E-I-K-O. Does it matter? Is, is it like a red? Well, you have to well, register the Well, we all want our names spelled right. Right. Does the dog get upset when you spell it wrong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, my friend? Long time no see. Very good. Thank you, you, you caused Dan. all this uh, hullabaloo. All right, tell me the story. What, what, what happened? You my, went to dinner one day. My husband what? and I went out to dinner to a restaurant in East Greenwich, and the owner of the restaurant came out. She was very upset. She knew I was a legislator. I had been there before with my dog. My dog was not with me that day. And she said, Charlene, I'm so upset. The health department came here and said, I can't have dogs on my outside patio anymore. So I said, well, did they say why? She said, no, they didn't even tell me why. She suspected there was a man that went there routinely for lunch, and he used to say he didn't like dogs, he was afraid of getting fleas. And she said, look, right next door, there was a restaurant that had three or five dogs sitting on their patio. So I told her, I said, well, I'll look into it. And when I did, I found there was no law in Rhode Island addressing the situation, although 39 restaurants in Rhode Island advertise that they do allow dogs on their outside patio. Really? Yes. Like the, in the fine print, dogs allowed? Or is, it, or is it part of their whole big marketing scheme? It's you, uh, there's a website you can go to, Dog Friendly Restaurants in Rhode Island. Really? And they're listed there. I did not know that. They even take out a bowl of water for the dog. Dogs sometimes get a drink, gets a drink before you do. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they'll even make a hot dog for the dog. Really? Yes. So what did you do? So after I looked into it, I said, we need a law to address the situation. This is totally unfair for a state department to go in and tell someone they can't do something that another business can do when there's no public safety issue or anything involved. So I drafted legislation last year, I might add, that passed the House last year that said that it shall be up to the owner of the restaurant to decide if they want to allow dogs in their outside patio. And um, I think we made the situation a lot better for those who don't want to visit a restaurant that allows dogs. They would now have to post a sign saying they do allow dogs if they do. And um, the dog would have to be with an adult on a leash at all times, could not go through the restaurant. So we set in some rules, but the main gist of it, it, it was not for myself or my dog. My dog had 38 other restaurants to go to in the state. It was to stop a government agency from interfering with a business. All right, well, I gotta follow up. When we come back, we'll find out why was that agency interfering? I don't know if the representative knows. We'll find out. But there's a couple other things going on in the state I might be able to get an answer on. Stay with us. Uh, that is a dog dining. Not very exciting, but, and that is a dog, I guess, going to dine. And that is dining. <laughs> did you get a lot of heat for this, or did you get a lot of applause for the dining, dog dining legislation? Well, it passed like easily. Yeah, it's election year. So we got yeah. the election year crazies that come up. Um, the legislation passed the House last year with all the members voting in favor of it. And this year we had uh, four Republicans. But what happened last year? The governor didn't sign it? Uh, I got caught up at the end of the year. Well, nonsense with the Senate right. that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it passed the House unanimously last year, but this year. Uh, we had some Representative Giarusso getting up against it and four Republicans voting against it. And these same four Republicans voted for it last year. In fact, one of them got up and seconded it. So um, it, I think it was just election year crazies. Uh, 
at the state. Well, I guess the whole notion is I, I can't answer for them, and I'm not going to defend them. I think it's a fairly innocuous conversation. And again, I've learned not to get too crazy with the dog owners because, you know, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, but against all the challenges that the state has, financially and otherwise, these kinds of bills do make some say, come on, man. Like, come on, man. Right. Dan, this bill took a couple of minutes to draft. I have a lot of other pieces of legislation I'm working on. In yeah. fact, Representative Giro, so that was his main concern, is we have much more important stuff to do. And yet, I would never get up on his legislation where he's uh, going to be naming a uh, week in April for historic some cemeteries because apparently that's important to someone in his district. So. We can multitask and focus on the important issues. We do that, but well, this was important to a business. Following up on, on the health department, do you know why they were, you know, choosing one restaurant versus another? Did you ever find out, or you just went ahead and wrote the le legislation preempting them from doing? I have no idea why. I guess they were responding to a complaint, and the only way they could respond was to tell one business they couldn't do it, which, which is, is totally not, unfair. Which is not the way. Well, that should be reviewed. I mean, whether you know, again, I'm not that focused on the actual problem at hand, but no state agency should be acting. Uh, unilaterally out of convenience mm -hmm. on any particular regulatory matter. We have a problem for, uh, of, of, of that in this state, do we not? Inconsistency mm -hmm. of regulation. It goes to the you got to know a guy, uh, blah, 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 blah. So there's a bigger picture actually inside mm -hmm. this saga. You got to find out why that why, yeah, why they did that. I think we have a new director there too, so hopefully things are going better. But I will look into that because that that's that was the main gist of the bill, and that that's what was wrong with the perception when you said that people did not even read the legislation. They assumed I was saying all oh, the restaurants okay now you all have to have dogs, and um, that was not the intent. In fact, Mike Stenhouse called in on the radio when uh, one of the shows was talking about it, and he said, "No, oh, government shouldn't stick their nose." And when I talked to him, he goes, oh, no, uh, the uh, Freedom and Prosperity Organization actually gave you a plus on this bill, and we're in favor of it because it prevents government from sticking their nose in private businesses. Well, there you go. It's the first time you probably got a winning number from them. I don't know. I you only have to check. Uh, speaking of numbers, Ted Nisi uh, tweeted out a story today that the DOT is still unsure how it's going to fund $38 million worth of gantries. They don't have a plan yet as to how they're going to finance them, where they're going to take the money from. In fact, they're thinking, well, maybe we'll provide some other alternative finance instrument that can then be backfilled and funded by the tolls once they get up. You think that's the right way to go about business? You voted yes on this toll program, correct? Yeah, I was against the original toll bill, and I was not going to support it last year. So why did you flip on this, or why um, did you evolve? Well, this year, we made it a much better bill, and um, I don't want Rhode Islanders to be the ones paying for this with the increase with the gas tax that was proposed because then you, your wife, your children are all going to be paying an additional 11 cents per gallon tax. Um, the way we changed this bill was that a truck, only an 18-wheeler driving through the state of Rhode Island pays 20 bucks. Two ways, 40 bucks. If they do it 10 times in a day, it never goes over $40. So it's not a lot of money to a truck to do this. It's like... So you say. No, um, I, I talked to a lot of the um, companies and regional managers, and it was it's negligible on our product. Our trucks are paying tolls in almost every other state, most of them on the Northwest Corridor, and yet trucks in other states are not paying here. This is going to, 60 to 70 percent of this money is going to come from out-of-state trucks are going to pay for this as opposed to so, all Rhode Islanders. Well, you know... I think most people are already exhausted in this debate. I'll tell you this much. It's not going to fly in the courts. I mean, the only state, which, uh, you didn't want to be an outlier, neither the governor. Now we're going to be the only state that only trolls trucks. And when they win in court, there's going to be one or two alternatives. Take $40 million worth of stanchions down, gantries, whatever, or toll everybody. And that will be the solution. I will never vote to toll cars. And I don't know how it's going to do in court, but I know Georgia tolls only cars. And your point is? Well, we don't know how it's going to go in court. In Georgia, the court has allowed them to toll only cars, so maybe the court will allow us to toll only the 14-wheelers. Well, the entire country is going to be watching the court case, no doubt, because mm -hmm. it could be a dam breaking. Um, 
I just think it's a terrible marketing message. Terrible marketing message. In a state that it's looking to loosen up the economy, we are going to create even more of a burden for goods and services to be moving through here. And uh, a lot of it seems to be an effort just to get a green project done. When you look back at it and you look forward, backward and forward, the governor really wants to, she wants to create a boulevard on the 610 connector. Now you're from Cranston. How much bus traffic is coming in that we need a double lane expressway under a tunnel for buses to come into Providence? I don't know. We have to look at that. There's that none does of go it. through my district. You, you, there's nobody knocking on your door saying, sure, we, we, need, we, need more bus, we need more buses from Cranston to Providence. Are there? Well, I do have a big constituency when they cut the bus routes. They call me that working did not against want RIPTA these. is one thing. I support right. RIPTA being fully funded. I don't think it even has to be profitable because it's a public service. But there's no high demand for doubling down on the bus traffic from Cranston into Providence, is there? I don't. They'd have to show me where the buses are well, totally well, that full very and green, they need them. Well, that very green project is really her motivation. She needs $400 million of federal funding to match what she's raising for the tolls in order to get that done. The only way to get that done is to get the tolls. This whole thing is, you know what, backwards in thinking. You know I, that, don't I you? I know that uh, Route 6 and Route 10 need to be fixed. Right. That I know. Redesigned is a whole different ballgame. Right. Well, take a look at it. Yeah. Well, I wish you'd all taken a look at it before you voted on this thing. Because the cart's out of the barn for the horses. Well, the dog's already eating at the dinner <laughs> table. When we come back, we'll find out what the representative's working on. Take her off the hot seat. Stay with us. Got a couple more minutes with State Representative Charlene Lima. So what are you working on? What else you got? Oh, I'm working on my foreclosed property upkeep act that we passed before where um, we were talking about foreclosed properties. You were talking about on your, with uh, some of your issues. Mm -hmm. and they Well, we're talking about people who are upside down who right. pay their mortgages. Right. It's good to keep paying your mortgages. It, get the economy. It keep is. Keep houses and their values together. It is. And not only for that reason, it uh, when you have a foreclosed property that's vacant in a neighborhood, the house has uh, is susceptible to crime. It really brings the neighborhood down. The house is falling apart, and it just sits there. So I'm working on legislation to get um, basically the foreclosed property owners, banks, whatever, to keep the properties up so the neighborhood doesn't go down. We had passed it one year before. I'm fine tuning that. Um, Rhode Island is known as one of the terrible twos when it comes to uh, protecting the consumer. Uh, because we do not have a precise interpretation of a deceptive trade act and we passed that once before I'm still wearing so some of the more complex bills um, they take time and fine-tuning and addressing people coming in against it or an issue here issue there whereas the dog bill was very simple and very quick to get done but it wasn't fast-tracked it was a year and a half so it didn't just happen. No, it did uh, not. Again, that was that was just uh, election year rhetoric to sound like they're fighting speaking something. Speaking of, you're running again, correct? Yes. You got anybody going out against you yet? Not that I know of. They like you in your district. I hope so. I hope I'm doing a good enough job for them, and hopefully the message is they keep reelecting me. So I take that as a sign. Well, let me tell you something. If the dogs had a vote. I'd You'd be never brilliant. have any opposition. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Good Thanks. to see you too, right, Dan. Final word and we come back. Stay with us. Had a big push on marijuana legalization, not just a criminalization. And there's a heavy hitter from Colorado coming into the General Assembly this week uh, to try to rattle the cage and push that thing through. He will be our guest on the program tomorrow, and we will learn all about what Colorado has gone through here on my state of mind. We'll see you on the radio tomorrow at noon time until three and until then, thanks for watching. Good night. I think it's